main topic of today's guest lecture is research methodology and scientific writing for the next about one hour. And after that, there will be a question and answer session and followed by discussion. And now, allow me to welcome Professor Kuswanto as graduate director of the Faculty of Agriculture to deliver a welcome speech for today's guest lecture. Professor Kuswanto, time is yours. Thank you, Mr. MC. Good afternoon. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, <coughs> and another, and welcome again. Welcome back in Malang. It is this twice in this semester. Chris come in uh, graduate program three months ago and now. Thank you very much. Uh, terima kasih kepada Pak Sahrul and thank you very much for all uh, to Julia, uh, Pak Buti, and Pak Cahyo. Thank you very much for your coming and uh, all of student in from Magister PTA, ya, pakai PTA, and then some student from the PhD program in here. Thank you very much for your coming. It is a good uh, time for you to discuss, or maybe you have some question, some problem about the publication, uh, especially international publication. It is the time, a good time for you to ask something, something to Prof. Uh, Chris Anderson. And thank you very much from uh, for Chris Anderson. Uh, tomorrow we will be in Swiss, Swiss uh, we are three person uh, as uh, speak uh, meeting, but the participant is different. Okay, itu uh, Terima kasih teman-teman mahasiswa yang telah hadir. Ini mudah-mudahan, mudah-mudahan kesempatan ini dimanfaatkan sebaik-baiknya, ya. Karena uh, tugas utama teman-teman uh, S2 maupun S3. Uh, adalah publikasi hasil penelitiannya. In Indonesia, we have regulation from our department, our minister, from uh, magister program and PhD. He publish his thesis or dissertation in international journal. So it is important for the student. Ya, saya kira demikian. Uh, Mudah-mudahan uh, teman-teman S2, S3 bisa memanfaatkan ini dengan sebaik-baiknya. Terima kasih uh, Panitia, Reni, dan kawan-kawan uh, yang sudah mengatur acara ini sehingga ini bisa berlangsung dengan baik. Uh, saya kira itu dan karena disuruh membuka uh, dengan mengucap bismillahirrahmanirrahim uh, acara Kuliah tamu pada siang hari ini dengan ini saya nyatak dibuka. Oke, okay. thank you very much for Profesor Kuswanto for giving us such a really great opening uh, session. And the next is allow me to welcome the speaker and also the moderator to start the presentation and Q&A session after that. Uh, Dr. Reni Ustiatik, the time is yours. Okay, I'm sorry. I think I forget to uh, giving announcement about our photo session. Please, uh, all lecturers of the soil department and also all the committee can uh, in the front and we will have a photo session first before our before we start our lectures yeah uh, please we need to uh, photo session as a report of this event okay. please student come to uh, or only the speaker the speaker and okay. also the lecturers Okay, only the and speaker.
this is part of reform. It's cool. This is the most important part. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe moving to the right side, please. Okay. Count, please. The mother, the MC, would you please join? Okay. Please, you are part of the band of the committee also. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, the time will be delivered by Dr. Randy Ostiatik, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Master of Ceremony, Bu Yulia Amirul Fata. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, students, the honorable lecturer lecturer of Soil Science Department, the head of uh, postgrad duet program Pak Kuswanto, the head of soil science department Pak Sahrul Kurniawan, uh, the head of soil biology laboratory Bu Yulia, also Pak Budi Prasetya. Welcome to guest lecture for all students. And my name is Reni Ustiati. I am a junior staff in soil science department. And I'm serving as moderator for today's guest lecture. The topic will be about research methodology and scientific writing. You will have uh, one hour lectures and one hour for question and answer session. So please pay attention and write your question and ask on the question and answer session. Please uh, do not hesitate to ask your question because of the language uh, we will translate for you. So uh, feel free to ask your question later during Q&A session. So before we are listening to Professor Christopher lecture, uh, let me introduce his background. His name is Professor Christopher Anderson. Or we can call him Prof. Chris or Pak Chris. That's a common thing in Indonesia. Pak Chris, yes, Pak Chris. <laughs> and he is the director of, uh, he's come from School of Agriculture and Environment, Messi University. And his research is about uh, soil chemistry, also the flux of uh, heavy metals from soil to plants. So for students that uh, have interest in continuing PhD for uh, doing phytoremediation or heavy metal remediation, you can uh, contact him uh, for suggestion or supervision. Okay, now one hour, you will have one hour for this lecture, it's yours. Thank you very much, Rennie. Thank you for that introduction. Now, I'm not going to sit down because I can't sit down and talk because that's just crazy. If I'm going to be talking for an hour, I'm going to be moving about. Um, but thank you for that introduction. It is a great pleasure to be back uh, here. So, problems with us, aren't we? There we go. Um, and that's my clicker. Fantastic. I, I, um, I had to think quite hard about what I today, because this is such a very broad topic. When we are thinking about public science, and you can see there's a lot of slides here, don't panic, because there's two presentations. There's a presentation today, and then there's a, the other one tomorrow. So, Rennie here asked me to talk very broadly about publishing science. That is huge. It is a massive subject area. We could spend hours talking about this, 
I've got one hour. So I'm going to try and provide some context. And I'm going to focus today on introductions. So that's actually my aim today is to spend some time working through how you can construct a good introduction. I think the introduction to your paper is the secret to success. Because if you can write a good introduction, you set yourself up to write a strong paper. So that's really where we, can, we try and get there today. I first came to Malang in 2010. And what's really interesting, and perhaps Pak Budi here could actually remember it, I gave a very similar presentation in uh, 2013. And nothing's changed. The importance of publications has not changed. I think just the amount of science is, is the only thing that's changed. And I teach my students these same hints. So I could easily be giving this lecture to my postgraduate students in New Zealand. Right, so first question, why do we publish? Because it's important to have that answer, right? We know we must publish, but why do we publish? It's a bit like a child. If you want a child to learn something, you explain to them why it is important to do something. And so I think uh, we, we're all children as well. We are children of learning. And so it's important to realize why we publish. Here are just some ideas to communicate our findings. All right. We know something, we find something, we tell people. I tell a story. So, one of the themes to this lecture today is the fact we're telling a story. When we get half an hour, can you tell me? Just say 30 minutes. Cool. Just will help me keep on track. Okay, so communicate our findings, the first thing. That allows us to gain peer esteem. That's why we want to publish as well. Because if we publish, well, if you publish, you get your degree. You get your master's, you get your PhD. But if we publish, we gain respect in the scientific community. We advertise our abilities. That goes on our CV. So we want to publish good science because that attracts people to us as good scientists that might lead to research funding okay if you're applying for research funding the funder will want to see what you've published so we've got to do a good job we can actually establish the first scientific ideas but then the sixth point is probably very true we publish because that's what we have to do. If you don't publish, you're not going to be very successful as a scientist. So what is science? And I think this is, again, as important. If we're going to talk about publishing, we need to think about what science is. Is, is it, do you want to change? Okay. Oh, that's better. That's much better. Okay. Phew. Right. So if we're going to do this properly, I think we need to actually have a clear definition of what science is. And so I want you to remember this. If you're talking to your family, you're talking to your children, you're talking to your relatives, and they say to you, what is science? Here's a definition our best ability to explain what we see based on what we know. Now, that's important in telling a story. We see something and we explain it based on what we know from a factual basis. Why are those leaves green? We can explain it because we know that 
photosynthesis occurs in leaves. Those leaves have chlorophyll in them. Chlorophyll is green. So we actually know something so we can explain what we see based on what we know. So facts are important, but science is more than just facts. And so there's some quotes here. And I'm going to leave these slides with you. So Rini Paksaru can circulate these slides so you can take notes, but I will pull out some points from some of these. Let's look at this last point. Okay, what is often missing from a thought of science is this idea of critical thinking. All right, there's another really important part of writing a paper, critical thinking. And that involves you assessing which ideas are reasonable and which are not. So we don't have all the answers. It's not just facts. We build on facts and you need to be critical in your thinking. Which ideas in your science are reasonable and which are not? Okay, so this is really important. If we build onto this and we think about what science is, let's look at that top point. Good scientists spend a lot of time assuming they are up to no good. You question yourself, critical thinking. Have I got this right? Did I make a mistake? Are my numbers correct? Did I have my controls in the right place? Question, 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 because you are supposed to be finding yourself if you are doing the right things. We're going to talk about peer review, actually. I'll be talking about peer review tomorrow. Who's, who's already tried to submit a paper for publication? Right, hands up if you've already tried to submit a paper. I would expect all of the lecturing staff will put their hands up. So we've been through peer review. And peer review is hard, but if you're doing a good job, you should be able to understand some of those key points. All right, so results. In your paper, the results section is where you show you are a good scientist. You have an experiment. You've defined it. You follow it. You conduct a process that is being a good scientist. So that results section, I did my experiment properly. I collected my data properly, and I know the data are right. That is really important. If you question your own data, then you have problems. So you need to be a good scientist. All right, discussion section. All right, we're going to talk about we're going to get into the details, I said an introduction. But remember, someone may not agree with your paper. You put your paper out there, you explain what you see based on what you know. There is no guarantee that everyone is going to agree with you. So this is a quote from a person from MIT. In your discussion section, you can sound smart. Someone might think you sound stupid. Doesn't matter. Science is really competitive, but you must always be good. You must follow a good scientific process. And that's when your results are so important. Because to be a good scientist, your results section has got to be right. So a good scientist follows a good process. Your data is 
right, then you can interpret what that means however you like. And not everyone will always agree with you, but as long as your data is right, that does not matter. I've published stuff that people don't agree with. It's still been published because the process was right. I was a good scientist. I followed a good scientific process. No one can deny you that. And that's where your design becomes so important. So good, right? And this is the point I wanted to get to. Your data should be true, even if your story is wrong. If you're a good scientist, your data is right. It is therefore true. It is not false. Then put it out there. Not everyone has to agree with your story. All right. So that is really important. Now, that is hard because you want everyone to agree with you. You want to publish and you want the scientific community to agree with your thinking doesn't always happen that way. But if you follow a good process, then it actually does not matter. Okay, so let's now think about the scientific process. And as you should all know, the scientific process comes down to the idea of a hypothesis. And the simplest definition I've ever found of a hypothesis is actually in a cartoon program about little dinosaurs. And it was made by an American company. And there's a dinosaur called Buddy. Uh, and it's a program called Dinosaur Train. I don't know if dinosaur trains ever got to Indonesia, but there's a very simple idea of a hypothesis or a definition of a hypothesis. And that is an idea you can test, right? So that's a hypothesis. A hypothesis is an idea you can test. And the testing part is really important. You could have a great idea, but an unless you can test that idea, it actually is not going to make for a valid scientific experiment. So what happens is that we notice something. I notice that those that the roof over there is brown. I propose a mechanism that there's a dye in the in the material that makes up the tiles that makes it brown. And then I can go ahead and test that through scientific experimentation. So what happens to test that hypothesis? You design and conduct an experiment. You analyze your results. And then you interrogate those results with statistics. That is the scientific process. It's an idea. You decide you can test it. You design the test. You do your experiment, you analyze your results, and then you use statistics to see what's happening. Okay, now we've got a result. We've done our test, we've done our statistics, we've got a result, and if the results support our initial hypothesis, we either prove the hypothesis is true or false, never happens that way, but that's the ideal situation. We carry on. Great. But if not, we modify the hypothesis. We change our variables and we do the system again. And that is the scientific process. Good, right, true. You're a good scientist. 
you follow that scientific process, your data is true. Your story might not be right, but that's becoming subjective. As long as you are a good scientist <coughs> and you follow that scientific process, then life is good. So that's really important. When you are writing your papers, you really need to focus in on those points. It's a process. You define your steps on your process. You work as hard as you possibly can to make sure that you're a good scientist and that your data are true. That's the science part. The rest of it is really just storytelling. And that will come with time. But the story is secondary to your data. So let's start looking into this. And as I promised you, I really want to focus on the introduction. But to get us there, I'll take a step back. And this is material that I teach my undergraduates in New Zealand. And in fact, I was just teaching this last week. So a scientific paper is just a report. It's what it is. It's a report on your scientific process. It's a report on the work that you did. It's that report on you being a good scientist. And that is what a professional scientist spends most of their lives doing, writing reports. Now, sometimes those are for specific clients. I've written numerous reports from work here in Indonesia for clients such as the United Nations, for New Zealand government, for the German government. So I've written reports focused on Indonesia for various clients. Sometimes your client might be a funder. It might be your supervisor. Other times we're just publishing our work in a journal. So you need to understand why you're writing your report. You need to understand any instructions that might be associated with this. And we actually need to know what a report is all about. So here's a definition of a report. An account given of a particular matter. So this is from a dictionary. An account given of a particular matter. So something, you know, an account of something, especially in the form of an official document. So it's official. It's a technical report after thorough investigation or consideration by an appointed person or body. So that's you all. You are appointed people. You are scientists. You're writing a report about something that you have spent time investigating to achieve a particular purpose. So that's what we're doing. When we're writing a report, it's focused. Particular thing, it's official, thorough investigation by someone who's appropriately qualified. Now, I don't know what you do in undergraduate, but we have big challenges in New Zealand for our postgraduate students because they sometimes get confused between reports and essays. All right, so do you write essays in your undergraduate programs here in Indonesia? Do you ever get asked in a particular course to write an essay? So publications, but what about undergraduate? So at undergraduate, then your bachelor's. Okay. Because often what happens is that when you do it, when you're studying a part of a course, you might be asked by your lecturer to write a, a 1,000 word essay on something. And quite often what the person well, what the lecturer is really asking is for you to write a report 
not an essay. So this is quite a useful table. This is from RMIT in Australia. And there's a couple of key things. Report provides objective information. It's impartial. The scientific process, there's no opinion in it. An essay is often subjective. It presents a writer's claim or argument. So there's a strong opinion base to it. Reports are structured. Essays don't tend to be structured. If we think about, I'm going to point to, think about that third box on the report. Sections can be read in isolation. Whereas with an essay, you have to read the whole thing to make sense of it. So it's actually quite simple, but it's really important again. Reports are well structured. Reports have defined structure and they are used to achieve purposes. So we need to think about the reports that we're doing. There's lots of stuff out there. I'm not, I just have this slide up. We have something called Grammarly. Do you ever come across Grammarly and, and you use Grammarly? Grammarly's really good. I'm pleased to hear that. Grammarly's fantastic. And look, how to write a report, a guide. Scientific paper is a report. So there's actually technology, AI now, that will help you on your mission to write your papers. Use it to give you that structure and definition. Okay, now we're getting into the sort of the real detail here. This is my opinion, all right? So now I'm being subjective. I'm not being objective, I'm now being subjective. From my years of experience, if you're gonna write a good paper, this is what your paper needs. First of all, you need a reason for why you're doing it, the reason for its existence. You've got to understand the reason for your work. You need a robust design. Then you need a good start and you need a good end. So scientific process is part of the design. You've been a good scientist. Your data is true, is kicked off by that design. Then you've got to tell the story. And that's where the introduction becomes important because you have a good start and that links into a good end. So remember, it's a story. When you are writing a scientific paper, it's a story. You're a good scientist. Your data is true. Tell your story. Not everybody's going to agree with it, but you can do a lot of work yourself to ensure that you are telling a story that your reader will follow. Now, the reason for your work really is up to you. I can't help you with that, all right? So that's your supervisor's task. Why you're doing that work, really you need to be questioning. Is this a good idea? Can I prove myself wrong? That's that second guessing yourself to make sure it's strong. You have a conversation that goes back and forward and back and forward until you establish that, yeah, this has got a strong idea. There's a really good reason for this work to be happening. Then you can actually explain its existence. So the first part often will stop a project or a paper even going any further. If you can't actually justify the reason for your bit of work, then it's going to be pretty hard to turn that into a journal article. So really that first one's up to you guys. 
But once it's established and you decide that there is a good reason, you've got to think about your design. Controls. Really, really important. You can't tell a good story unless you've got your controls. Here's a strong statement. You use controls to get rid of bias and bad data. Okay, your data is true. How do you make sure your data is true? How do you make sure that your data is not, is actually not false? You have controls. Now, it's actually one of the hardest parts of experimental design. And I'm not talking about experimental design here. You got to go talk to a statistician. Okay, I'm sure in, in the faculty of Putanian, you've got statisticians. You need to talk to them because designing the right controls is so important. When you put your paper up for peer review, it's actually one of the points that's often criticized the most. You don't have a control. How can you say this? Because you have nothing to compare it to. So that control is really important and they have to make sense. So let's look at an example. And I'm just going to give you a bit of context here. So this is a, an example that um, I thought of last night when I was sitting on the plane because it represents a conversation that I had with one of my PhD students just last week. So context, this was a publication of mine from last year. It's about cadmium. It's about different forage crops in New Zealand farming systems and how our changing of forage crops is changing the accumulation of cadmium in sheep, primarily in New Zealand. So that's the context. And then here's another part. So this was a study I'd done earlier. And I have a PhD student who's come from um, Papua New Guinea, actually. And she is working on a subject called regenerative agriculture. So this is a really big thing in New Zealand at the moment. And I think we might see this is going to start coming here to Indonesia too. So regenerative agriculture is an agricultural system that tries to achieve all of these points, especially things like multi-species pastures, outstanding animal welfare. Okay, we've got a big component of biodiversity here, improved soil health, and uh, carbon is part of it. All right, so here's the context, regenerative agriculture, and then a study looking at different forage crops in our farming systems. So this is what the student came up with as an experiment. So remember, we're trying to combine this pre-existing knowledge about cadmium and forage crops into animals. And then we're also thinking about regenerative agriculture. And so this project was about cows and sheep. You can see some soil detail there, got stocking rates. All of those are normal parameters. Then we come to our treatments. And we've got five treatments defined in this study. First one conventional pasture, but under conventional grazing. So there's a treatment combination, normal pasture, normal farm management. Next treatment, conventional pasture. So normal pasture, but under a regenerative farming management system. So those two make sense. Okay, one's comparing the other. Next two, diverse pastures under regenerative farming systems. 
And then the fourth one, diverse pastures under conventional farming systems. So we've got a combination, we've got all the combinations there, diverse under conventional, diverse under regenerative, and then conventional pasture under conventional management, conventional pasture under regenerative. What the student wanted to do was put in a fifth treatment, chicory under conventional grazing. Now, chicory is a one type of pasture. It's a crop, it's a herb crop that is one type of pasture. So the student wanted to put in a fifth treatment, which was chicory under conventional grazing, but we had to throw that out because there is no control for it. We cannot compare that treatment back to any of the other four treatments because we do not have the right combination of data there to make anything meaningful. So this will evolved hours of conversation. So that treatment cannot be defined as a treatment because it's got no control. What we decided to do was actually make that the control because what that allowed us to do is link regenerative farming systems back to that earlier paper about forage crops and the accumulation of cadmium through the system. So it's complicated. Now, I don't expect you to take that away, but what I expect you to think is that when you add in more treatments, you've got to decide whether it works as a viable treatment or whether you are deciding that in fact, your new treatment can be defined as a control. And if you reset your control, then your statistical design will follow through. So it's really, really complicated. Talk to your statisticians, talk to your supervisors, because you've got to get this design right at the start before you can tell your story. I've frozen. Let's we'll go to the next one forward. I think the whole thing's frozen. There we go. Okay, cool. So there we go. So little checkpoints up the top there. Reason for existence. So remember, these were my four secrets to putting together a good paper. How are we doing for time? I'm just doing a time check here. Okay, good. Well, you I said half an hour. See, I knew. I, I said to her, give me half an hour, and you bang on half an hour. All right. So first point, reason for existence. Have you got a strong reason for your study to be taking place? Tick. Have you got a robust design? Do you have appropriate controls that's going to allow you to explore that reason for existence? Tick. Great. Do your study. The next thing is to when you start writing up how you can prepare a good start. And this is where we get to the idea of an introduction. Now, this is where I'm going to give you what I think is a really useful tool to try and write the introduction to your report. Now, you can use this for a report to your supervisor, a report to your boss, a report to a funding agency, or you can use this as a structure for your scientific paper. And it's the idea of what we call an inverted pyramid. And I say inverted because I've taken a pyramid and I've flipped it over. The start is the start of your introduction. Start with broad context, set the scene, 
And what's happening is we get progressively more and more focused in our writing until we get to the point of the introduction. And the point of the introduction is to outline the aim of the work you've done. And to explore this, I'm actually going to now shift and we're going to pull up a scientific paper. And I'm going to talk about the paragraphs and see if we can fill in this inverted pyramid for what I'm looking at. So I want to change from that to there's a PDF. Yep. So if we can change that, that screen and we'll put up the PDF that we've got. And what we'll do is that we're going to work through this to see how this looks. I know we're live on YouTube. Oh, cool. Thank you. All right. So just to assist with that, as my tech support does what they're doing, I'm just going to, just going to draw up the idea. Cool. Now, we're just going to, what we're going to do is we're only going to go through the introduction. So we won't have to make that bigger. Cool. Cool. Go a bit bigger. Right. Now, go, go bigger. One more. Bigger. Yep. Right. Now, let's oh, back out. Make it slightly smaller. Yeah, well, there we go. This is like the game. Tech control, tech control. We're going to try and fill it up. Okay, good. Now, let's go down to the introduction. So, uh, what this is a, I, I, I'm going to leave you guys with this paper. I think this is a great example of a paper that has really good structure. So, what you need when you're writing papers is you need some examples of papers that have really good structure. I reckon this is a great example of one that's got a fantastic introduction. So by all means, take this away and use it. It's got a really great abstract too. And you'll notice that the abstract's actually got purpose, methods, results, and discussion, but not all journals will allow you to present an abstract in that format. So I'm not gonna talk about the abstract, but if we can just go down to the start of the introduction, um, we'll have a look because we're just going to focus on the introduction. All right, cool. So whoop, here we go. So just as a bit of context, actually, I'll keep that ready. Um, just as a bit of context, this is a study, and it, it's we were talking at lunchtime today about carbon, and actually this is about carbon. And this is about what we call consumption-based accounting and production-based accounting. And it's looking at different ways to estimate the greenhouse gas emissions associated with these different approaches to quantifying carbon in industrial processes. If you're interested, you can read the paper. But what I want to do is I want to look at how the introduction has been written. And I want you to be thinking about the start. Okay, because this is the start of our introduction. This is the end of our introduction. And I want you to be thinking about the fact that as we look through this, our description and our text starts broad, but gets progressively more and more focused until we get to the aim. So as I talk through the paragraphs, think about this in the context of an inverted pyramid. So let's read the first statement. Okay, so a good example shows you how to write things. Because I will admit, one of the hardest things about even writing an introduction is, what do you say first? What's the first comment you put down on paper? Because you've got to grab the reader's attention. So let's look at this one. Introduction. One of the most urgent environmental challenges of our time is climate change. Right. Really broad statement. But what it instantly does is that identifies that this work is about climate change and more specifically if we look at the second sentence it's about greenhouse gas emissions and greenhouse gas mitigation 
So straight away, the reader knows, okay, this works about climate change and greenhouse gases. That's really important because instantly in the broadest context possible, we've established what this works about. Okay, so there's lots of ideas in there. So we look at that introduction, GHG, New Zealand, and so clearly we're talking about New Zealand as well. So it's giving us that context and that makes sense because I come from New Zealand. So I'm talking to you about a New Zealand paper. Right, so if we just move down and we look at that full paragraph, so if we just scroll down a little bit further, what we see now is that, okay, we've, we've established we're about GHG emissions. The second paragraph, we pick up on that idea of GHG emissions. So we've got a whole lot of ideas there. New Zealand, GHG emissions, Kyoto Protocol, emissions trading scheme, international commitments. So we've started off really broad. Basically, you could say climate change. And then we've actually got a bit more specific, right? You could argue that we've now got to New Zealand's commitments. All right, so we're still working under climate change, but our second paragraph has now got quite focused detail that's talking about New Zealand's commitments as far as the uh, as far as GHG is concerned, and we bring into the fact that in New Zealand we've got big issues around agriculture, okay, um, farm management practices, biological GHG emissions, methane and nitrous oxide. So what we're doing there is we're talking about New Zealand and we're talking about New Zealand's challenges there in its GHG cycle. All right, so it's getting a bit more detailed. All right, let's look at the next paragraph. This is where it's a pain because we've got the columns, but we'll go down. All right, so let's have a think about this wall. Now, this is quite a big, this is quite a getting, this is now another big one. So it starts there under the Kyoto Protocol and its successor, and it carries down a bit. Let's just see how far it goes. So let's just keep scrolling down. Oh, it's quite a long one. Oh, geez, a lot to read there, but let's have a look. All right, so, okay, we've got a responsibility, um, and then it says there's a really important phrase there. This approach is known as production-based accounting. Ah, okay, there's a new concept. PBA, production-based accounting is a brand new concept. So let's see what else is here. According to the PBA approach, oh, it must be important. We've mentioned it again. Okay, um, we've got some comment. Although the approach is straightforward and widely used, it is often criticized. So it's still talking about PBA. Ooh, for example, the PBA approach. So if we look at the next sentence as well, right? So clearly this is about production-based accounting, which sits under New Zealand's commitment to climate change. So we've got a bit more focused. So now we're actually talking about PBA. We've brought in a brand new concept, a new term that actually seems to be quite important. Okay, cool. So let's go back up to the other side. So we'd have to go up again now to get to the next column. So we'll look at the next paragraph. Um, and that's really just to finish off. So the start of that start of that column is just a continuation of our PBA um, our PBA section. So actually just go back up one more because we've just we'll look at the next paragraph. Sorry, we'll just go up a little bit. I've got you on the spot, you see. You've got the hard job. I get to talk, he has to do the tech. Okay, and then we get to the next approach, next paragraph. Okay, what's the subject of the next paragraph? CBA now. Ah, okay, so this is another concept. Now, interestingly, this is where my, my uh, pyramid's probably taken a bit of a detour, all right? I've almost actually gone a bit linear because we've got this block so I've got a para I've got a paragraph that was about PBA and now I've got a paragraph about CBA but clearly these are really important concepts that I need to put down all right so we've got it about that so that's cool all right so we're, we're getting the hang of this let's have a look at the next paragraph then all right 
here we go. There is growing interest in quantifying consumption-based emissions. Okay, for example, we've got some databases there. Okay, we've got some MRO, we've got lots of text. So we're starting to bring in some other ideas here. We've got databases, but I can see that this paragraph, if we come down, it says these studies concluded that the CBA and PBA approaches. So what's happened now is that I've defined PBA, I've defined CBA, and now I'm bringing them together. All right, so this is actually getting quite useful. So I'm defining my tech terms, I'm defining the concepts, I'm introducing them bit by bit, don't know why yet, but there's a logical story happening here. Now, the only other thing I'll point out is that we've started to bring in databases, WIOD database, GTAP based MRIO analysis. So we're starting to also bring in CBA and PBA techniques that are quite valuable. All right, so let's go and look at the next paragraph. So we've done that page, so let's have a look next. So we'll have to go over. We're getting to the end of it, so we'll carry on down. All right, okay, now we've got a table. I'm gonna come back to the table, but let's carry on to the text, because I like this table. This is a great example of a table. All right, so we've got now a, another paragraph. Let's have a look at this one. There are, however, a limited number of studies on calculation of New Zealand's GHG emissions using a CBA approach. Okay, so we've now changed tact a bit. We've defined PBA, we've defined CBA, we've brought them in together, but now we're actually kind of changing our terms a bit. We've said for the first time that we're linking CBA directly to New Zealand. And particularly, we've said there are a limited number of studies. Now, what that's actually telling us is a knowledge gap. Well, this is a lit review. And if we look down, so it says table one, and then what's actually happening here is it says the next paragraph, as a first attempt, Andrew and Forgy estimated CB uh, emissions of New Zealand for the year 2001 and compared them to production-based. Okay, that sounds cool. Um, this analysis was based, et cetera. What that entire paragraph is, is actually a lit review and it's a knowledge gap. All right, I might start drawing some lines here now. So now we're getting really specific. Now we're getting into the stuff we don't know. We're doing a review of all of that literature. So let's just go back up and look at that table. Because if we think about that as a lit review, let's see what's actually in the table there. All right, so table one, studies on calculation of New Zealand's GHG emissions using a consumption-based accounting approach. Study. There's one, two, three, four, five, six studies that have indicated. We've got the type of article. We've got a category of peer-reviewed accounting approach. You can see some did both, some did CBA only, year of analysis, method of analysis, and scope of analysis. And we've actually got data about the method. So MRIO analysis, GTAP, EURA-based. So there's a whole heap of data in here. But what it's doing is it's reviewing the integration and the comparison of PBA, CBA. We've defined what they are. We've said why they're important because they're about New Zealand's commitment. And why is that important? Because we're talking about climate change. So let's now go and look at the very final paragraph. Because remember I said to you, at the end of our introduction, we should have an aim. So let's have a look. And that big lit review paragraph goes all the way to the sentence that ends developed for the United States. So the last paragraph there, given the limitations of the existing work on this topic, knowledge gap, 
This study undertook an MRIO analysis using the EORA database to investigate the policy implications of using a CBA versus PBA approach to calculating New Zealand's GHG emissions. That is the aim. The study also aimed to identify the economic sectors that account for the largest share of consumption and production based GHG emissions. Now, if we'd read that paragraph at the start of the introduction, it would have made no sense. Because we need to look at it. Every single concept in that last paragraph has now been defined. The aim is built on our knowledge gap, which has come out of the comparison of PBA, CBA, which we have defined and which we have explained as part of New Zealand's commitment. And why is New Zealand committed to meeting uh, GHG emissions? Because we've got climate change. So we can go from our aim and we can work back through all the steps to our broad context. We can go the other way. We can start broad and we can chase that information through to the aim. The point. Inverted pyramid. The broad context. Here's the point. And that is the point of an introduction. The introduction to any report you write must establish the point of your report. When, you, when a reader finishes reading your introduction, they need to understand what you've done and why you've done it. That sets up your story. I think that's a really good example. Now, I teach that example to my undergraduate students and my postgraduate students because it's been really well constructed. And I would encourage you to pick up papers that you might have written in the past. Pick up one of your lecturer's papers and do the exercise. Can you work through and understand the structure of an introduction? Does it make sense? Right, let's go back to the slides and we'll finish off. How are we doing for time, boss? 10 minutes, good. I wasn't sure how that was going to go, but that seemed to go well. That was all right. I think it's a really, really useful example just to understand what happens. And, as I, and I think that introductions are super important. One of my biggest concerns when I review papers is I get to the end of the introduction and there seems to be no point to the work. There is no aim. It makes no sense. All right. Is my clicker going to work? No, it's not. I'll let you do the next slide then. I think I've run out of batteries on this one. All right, so that's that's the workup. All right, a bit more involved here, but you can see that that model is what we've done. Climate change, New Zealand's response is part of global initiatives. We worked through the CBA, the PBA, worked through the knowledge gap. There is the aim. We've gone from broad context and we've got to the point. Is it working now? Oh, there we go. It does now. Yeah, I was trying that one. It just didn't, maybe you turned it on and off. Okay. So as we pull that together, part of that table, a really useful, sorry, part of that introduction was the table. And I'm a great believer in introductions, but I'm also a great believer in tables because tables are a really cool way to compare and contrast data. And we saw that in the table we just looked at. You can collect your data. You can categorize it. You can compile it. You can then decide what is important. You can then pull out and present that key information. And you can selectively discuss aspects of it, in this case, through a literature review, 
to tell your story. So I highly recommend tables. And we saw that in that Chandrakuma paper. Okay, that was a really well constructed table. Notice it's got a nice table number, it's got a nice caption, it's well formatted. And the layout and the design of that table depends on the author. You know, the author has decided to use those column headings because those are the column headings that suited the knowledge gap that was being identified through the literature review. You have the chance to put the key information there and then you pull out the ideas that you want to use as part of your story. Now, sometimes the table doesn't work. And I just put this in as a, a bit of a, a, almost a joke example. You know, this is a, a, this is a table one of my students tried to give me once. Now this is a lousy table and it's bad because all it is is a list of bullet points. So yes, it's a table, but what's happened here is that we've got two publications and we've got a series of bullet points. And you could see at the start, it kind of makes sense. The left-hand column is 312 farming sites. The right-hand column is 1794 samples. Okay, so we're comparing sample numbers. That makes sense. Then we've got mean soil concentration. We've got mean soil concentration. We've got range, we've got range. But we've kind of now got offset. We're not doing a direct comparison. Notice that we then got on the left-hand side, pastoral land use, but then there's no real, well, then there's a long chunk of land use on the right. Then we've got soil types on the left. There's no soil types on the right. And then there's no real comparison for the last comment. All this table needed was a third column, a column on the left that had parameter. Sample number, mean concentration, concentration range, land uses, soil type, correlating variables. That would have been a huge advantage because it would have turned this table into an easier comparative discussion that would suit your story. So remember to use things like tables as part of your structure to present that knowledge to identify the knowledge gap. Okay, so we've got the start. As I say, I think it's a great example, but you've got your start. You're a good scientist. Your data is true. You've discussed it. Remember, not everybody has to agree with it. Don't worry, but you had a good start. You're a good scientist. What you need now is a good end. And this is kind of just as hard sometimes as your introduction. So the end could be summary, or it could be recommendations, or it could be conclusion. Depends on what you want to do to tell your story. But you need to be concise. You should have already discussed all of the information. Your end needs to be concise and pull it together. You need to be careful about introducing new material because conclusions should not have references. So you do have to be careful about bringing new ideas into the end of your story. If it's a brand new idea that you want to discuss, discuss it and then summarize or conclude it at the end. So be careful around that. And my big point is that you've really got to answer the question of, so what? Right, you, you've told a, you're a good scientist. You've started well. If you want to finish well, you need to leave the reader with an answer to that question of, so what? So why is this important? So what? You did this. What does it mean? You've got to finally distill that meaning into a concise bit of text 
that makes sure you've achieved your aim. So always ask that question. So you get to the end of it, think to yourself, so what? Have I answered the reviewer's question of so what? Is my meaning, is my aim being delivered on? Finish strongly. Now, depending on your journal, there's two ways to do this. Some journals do not allow conclusions. So they actually say you must finish with discussion. And if you do that, what you need to be doing is have an integrated discussion. Your final part of your discussion needs to be the so what. So here's an example. I did this one for Rennie because we're talking about Mercury. All right, so here's a journal paper that I wrote with some colleagues in China a number of years ago. And this was the final part of the paper. This was the trying to tie it all together. And you notice that the heading there is implications of mercury biomagnification through the terrestrial food chain or public health. That's a title that says, so what? Don't worry, Rennie, I've nearly finished. Um, that's a title that says, so what? Right? Implications, public health. I'm pulling everything together to answer that, so what? Right. In this particular case, there was no conclusion. Notice I've still got references there because it is discussion, but it's a discussion that is pulling my work to an end. I finish strongly and I reflect on the fact that I've met my aim. Got to do that. The other option is you have a conclusion. And that's up to you, or maybe it's up to the journal. Interestingly, this is the same journal, Environmental Pollution. And depending on how you're telling the story in this journal, you can choose to finish with integrated discussion, or you can finish with conclusion. And this one's around mercury methylation in uh, southern south in Guizhou province, Rennie, where you're going to go. This is where you're going to be heading to, right? <laughs> and here we go. Here's a conclusion. There's no references. Notice there's no citations there because conclusions should never bring in new material. If you need to bring a new material to a conclusion, it's out of place. You've got to go back and add it to the discussion so that you can bring it back into the conclusion. But there we go, final statement. However, ongoing work is urgently needed to conduct further or continue our understanding. Bring it to the end. You answered the so what, because the reviewer goes, okay, I get it. That's why it was done. Yep, that makes sense. I'm happy with this. You've brought your story to a close. So that's it. That's my message. Simple, but so effective. That is your take home message. The secret to your publication, because you are all good scientists, the secret to your publication as a good scientist is your story. Make sure you know why that story's come to be, the reason for existence. If that reason doesn't exist, it doesn't evolve to a publication. If it's going forward, make sure, because you're a good scientist, you've got that robust design. Then you've got a good start, you've got a well-structured introduction, and you've got a good end. And structure is what allows you to tell that story. It's true. Someone may not like it, but that's no reason to reject it. If the data is true, if you are a good scientist and your structure helps you tell a good story, no good journal should reject your work. So structure helps you tell your story and creates a strong publication. Structure is actually what writing is all about. 
and that is me. So when I initially was writing my talks at three o'clock this morning, and we're finishing them, I was going to do this one second to what I'm going to do tomorrow. So what I did is that those first slides I actually pulled out of yesterday's, but this is what I wanted to get across to you guys. Your structure and helping you make your work better. Okay, uh, for excellent speech, and we are moving to the question and answer session. Okay, for ladies and gentlemen, please uh, raise your hand when you have any question. Please raise your hand. I mean, I will admit that it's harder to ask questions on this because I haven't presented science. Yep. Okay. Yep. Uh, please mention your name and say. Uh, you know, you're going to be a runner? Okay. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity. My name is Stuart from Soil and Water Management uh, Postgraduate Program. I would like to ask Prof about how to create a good pathway in research. Thank you. So you might need to just help me how to create a good pathway. So in what context? Are you talking about your own personal pathway? Are you talking about a research project. So a research project. Um, so I, I mean, it, that's no, it's a re, actually that's a really interesting question. A good pathway. So I think we need to realise that that science is evolving. I mean, you know, the scientific process is a case of having a hypothesis. You do some work. You never prove or disprove a hypothesis ex absolutely you will find something about that allows you to evolve your hypothesis. So a research pathway can be taken at different levels. You as an individual, what happens as you ex gain experience through research is that you're understanding how you can better design your next experiment. You're working out how you can discount bias and you're improving your ability to communicate. So you're at the stage where, and you're a postgraduate study program, you know, what you might evolve to in your own research pathway is working in a research center. You'll be doing exactly the same things. You'll be having that discussion with people. Is this, is the reason for this scientific experiment got good substance? If the answer is yes, you have the next conversation. How do we design it to maximize the, the well, to, to optimize the good data? How do we design it so that we've got statistical control, that we've got rigor to it? And then you do the experiment. I mean, I find it quite interesting that, you know, I'm, I've learned more about the basics of science as I've got more experience with science, I feel I actually have far more knowledge now about how to actually substantiate doing my science than I did when I was a PhD student. I feel I my, my science I did was much better as a PhD student because then I did the science. So research pathway is really interesting. Right now, you are focused on a very small area of science. You're becoming an expert on something quite small. And what will happen through your career is you will increase your breadth of knowledge. And you won't spend all your time on one thing, but what will happen is that you will have the wisdom and experience to support the people that are working on those very tight things. So research pathway is finding an area where you can answer the so what. When someone says to you, you've done this, so what? 
when you can actually respond to them and say, well, it was quite clear. There was a knowledge gap. I did this because we needed to resolve that knowledge gap so that we could move forward. And that takes time and experience. But it's the scientific process and you'll keep working through those steps as you go through. I don't know if that remotely answers your question, but it's, it is a really interesting one because, you know, a pathway is a long-term game. And it's all about what you want to do in the future with your science anyway. Cool. Okay, any, feed huh? any feedback? Okay, um, moving to the next question, please raise your hand. Okay, we have three. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Gufran Wake. I'm from uh, Mungkin in uh, speaking bahasa. Yes, uh, I will ask for you terkait dengan uh, background. Uh, mungkin kalau kita menyebutkan segitiga terbalik itu ada uh, gap analysis atau knowledge gap. Nah, uh, bagaimana caranya kita untuk uh, create the gap analysis dari hasil penelitian sebelumnya untuk menghasilkan uh, good research selanjutnya? Okay, I'm. To translate your question so he is asking about how to create gap analysis how to determine our uh, gap of study so we can fill in our study can fill in the gap between the previous studies so we can have a good research and uh, have data to uh, write report for scientific publication thank you um, okay, now that's, a, again, that's a really good question. How to do the gap analysis? That's your science. I mean, you know, if you're doing postgraduate study, you do a literature review. So in this particular case, we knew we were interested in, well, actually, I'll take a step back. This work was done by a PhD student. So this paper was published by a PhD student. It was a PhD student at Massey, and that student was interested in climate change. And that student was working on different approaches to quantify the emissions associated with agriculture in New Zealand. So that's, that was the grounding for the study. Student, PhD, part of life cycle analysis. That was our research cluster at Massey that, that was being done under. But the student was interested in climate change and was interested in different approaches. With that defined, the student did a lit review. So any, especially PhD, but masters as well, you know what your general topic is and you need to do that literature review to work out what the knowledge gap is. So you can't, I mean, there's no way that this study would have proceeded unless there had been the literature review. So that's part of the work. So then the next part of the question is, is how can you optimize your analysis of literature? Well, my answer to that is tables. So when I have students that are, starting a PhD and they're spending their first six months reading, I'm getting them to build big tables. And what's happening is that they are constantly looking for criteria that they can extract data from. And these are big, these are in Excel. They're almost like you build a database where here's a new paper, you analyze the paper, according to your criteria, and you fill that information in. Then you look at it at a whole, and you say, there are some big gaps, because parts of your table are not filled in. And you relate that back to the fact that you're looking at PBA, CBA, you're looking at climate change, because that defines the literature that you're searching for. And there, comes your knowledge gap. 
So there's no, I mean, there is technology you can use. There's databases and interrogation and an AI. There's a whole lot of stuff you can do. But in all reality, that is you becoming familiar with your study area. Now, you have to have that familiarity to define your exact topic, but you've got to read. And then tables is the way I think you should analyze what you find. So have a big table. And as soon as you pick up a new paper that you want to read, start filling in table, pulling out data, put it in your table so you can start to see over time what that knowledge gap is. I don't have an easy answer. It's just hard work, hard work. Okay, any feedback? Okay, we are moving to next question, please. Giorona? Please. Terima kasih atas kesempatan yang diberikan. Saya tertarik dengan tadi mengontrol data itu, Prof. Jadi, kita sudah melakukan penelitian, terus kemudian sudah mendapatkan banyak data. Nah, bagaimana kita bisa menginterpretasikan data ini dengan baik, gitu ya? Ternyata sebaran data itu ya dibilang apa ya bad data seperti itu. Artinya acak sekali sehingga waktu kita analisis itu not signifikan semuanya seperti itu jadinya. Nah ini mohon apa tahapan apa yang bisa saya lakukan eh, sehingga saya bisa menginterpretasikan data itu dengan baik. Terima kasih. Uh, coba. Eh, tapi nanti kalau ada yang kurang mohon dikoreksi. Check. I'm trying to translate. So uh, how to control the data? So she has uh, quite a lot data, but how to... Uh, analyze the data because the data distribution it's uh, quite so all the analysis result is insignificant so how to control the data thank you um yep okay now again so and that's it the easy well the only real answer to that is is talk to a statistician um and, and this is so this is getting away from you know the the mechanics of writing a paper into actually the complexities of your data so you know there are a new there are numerous tests we can do i mean testing for normality transforming data so there are ways that we can actually try to manipulate that data to actually discern the effects and you really do need to talk to a statistician statistician um, there are statistical packages that will do that but you just got to keep playing with it Sometimes there is no significant difference and you really can't make a significant difference if there is no significant difference and there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. Unfortunately, that never looks as good for a publication, but if there is no significant difference, then that's still information that relates back to your hypothesis. And I've seen many studies published like that where there's been a really good hypothesis. It's a robust design, but for whatever reason or another, there were no significant differences. That still is a story to tell. And then you can start to unpack the reasons why there are no significant differences. You know, you look for comparison to literature and actually you learn a lot from those sorts of studies because it tells us that actually from a so what perspective, that is an area of science we need to stop worrying about and actually celebrate the knowledge that's there. So again, I don't have an easy answer. Data complexity is resolved through statistical analysis. I am not a statistician. So that is where you'll have to engage with the right support but at the end of the process if there's still no significant difference carry on publish it because that is still actually really important information you need to stop someone else repeating what you've done um, because there's always going to be mechanisms there's going to be mechanistic understanding that's associated with that study which still tells a really good story in that case your data is true 
your science is good. Give it a start. Give it an end. It's still a publication. So don't be fearful of that. Check. Any feedback, Bu? Uh, we are moving to the next question. We still have time. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for this opportunity. My name is Giorona uh, from Master and so uh, Soil and Water Management. Uh, I will ask about uh, how we can to help and uh, integrate the AI, such as like uh, maybe ChatGPT, Quillbot, and then like being now that was a big, uh, big uh, research machines, search machines our publication in our scientific publication thank you yep yep now that's a really topical question and i can tell you that globally um we are struggling with that but i'll give you my thoughts we we are trying to well the way we look at ai from the perspective of science in New Zealand is with respect to the word credibility. Now, AI is a tool. You can use it, and I would encourage you to use it. It's a tool. It's an amazingly powerful tool. But remember, it is only a tool. And so what you need to do is that if you are trying to find something or you're trying to make a start with your writing, yeah, ask ChatGPT for what it comes up with. Ask it to provide references. Very first thing, check if those references are real because sometimes AI makes up references and there's a huge danger if you use AI without thinking about the credibility of it and just replicate or just present what AI tells you, you can come into a lot of trouble and your own credibility then is called into question. We, um, some of the stuff that I've been talking about today, we, we start teaching our first year bachelor's students and we make them do some very simple um, assignments. And what happens is that students are now, maybe 15% of students are using AI. And some of those students, take the assignment brief, they put it into AI, they just accept what AI tells them and they submit that work. Now, sometimes they get lucky. AI has come up with credible references, but other times it's a complete fail because we can tell very quickly with Turnitin and all the other techniques if the reference is real or not. Where AI is really interesting and really useful and powerful for you is if you understand what you're trying to do, right? You go back to my points. You understand the rationale for your study. Once you know that and you know the robust design, then yeah, give it a part of your story and ask it to go and give you a result. Have a look at it. Does it make sense? Does the answer that AI gives you relate to your rationale for the study? Do they connect? If the answer is yes, then take that as a piece of information, then go and ask ChatGPT another question, and then another question, and then another question, and build up a bigger picture. You will have to rewrite it yourself anyway, because remember, AI doesn't understand it's purely looking for word associations. Your brain understands, and you need to make sure you mold all of that because it's a tool. But by all means, use it. It is out there. Just use it credibly because it's your credibility that's at stake if you use it badly. Some journals, so there's a real big argument in science. And I'll take two really important journals as an example, Nature and Science. You guys have all heard of Nature and Science. I can't remember which one is which. One says, yes, you may use AI, 
but you need to acknowledge where you've used it. The other says you will not use AI. So there you go. There's no consensus between those two journals. So we're not going to find consensus. Just think of your own credibility. That's my strongest advice around that. But yeah, it's a really good question again. It's everywhere around the world we're grappling with what it means for the future. And we're, it's here to stay and people will use it. You're crazy not to use it, but use it well. Be a good scientist. Good questions, guys. I'm very impressed. Okay, thank you. Any question? We, we, uh, up at the front, we've got a hand, oh, yeah. hand, hand up. Uh, she is our staff I too. So we put her at the last. Booty had a question too. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, sir. Uh, as you mentioned before, the, the good uh, scientific paper will be started with strong. And you already tell us about the great example about the introduction. And uh, I have a experience about writing some publication and I really have a lot of uh, strict uh, comment from my supervisor and right now, I just still really, really hard to write good introduction. And yep. what my question is, and my first question is, how do we, uh, how can we write a good introduction not being time consuming? And the second is exactly because I feel hard to write a good introduction, so I just put it in the last steps. Yep. And what is your opinion about it? Because I just not uh, write an introduction in the beginning. Thank yep. you. I, I totally agree. Writing a good introduction is hard and it takes practice. What I've tried to do is give you a framework to allow you to start the process. When you write the introduction, it's always quite interesting. You know, you know in your mind why you know you, you've defined the study you've de developed it you do the study so the very first thing that you write usually is your methods because that you've done that that's easy and so remember the whole point of your methodology is to give sufficient detail that someone else will be able to repeat your work so normally that's where you start then you write your then you put your results together because that's kind of easy as well and it's at about that point where you've done the, the first bit of your, you know, your work, then you've got to go back and really think now about your literature review, okay? Because that's the knowledge gap. You know this, you know the general context, so then you've got to start there. Because that literature review then is what is helping you with the discussion. Because when you discuss your results, you have to discuss the results within a context and the context is set by this so your method allows you to really understand what you've done you already know in this part do this and then it will start to fill in because what this is really doing is it's organizing the structure and introductions chop and change just like any lit review you know, you might decide that actually this has got to go here, then that's got to go there, and then that's got to go there. It constantly changes as your discussion changes. So, there's, you know, you don't just sort of do it and then it's finished. You evolve it as your writing happens. But I guess my encouragement is that here's a way to think about it. Take a step back. You're trying to write an introduction. Where do I start? Just start with a broad comment. You know what your aim is, and then you've got a way to start filling it in. And it takes practice. I mean, maybe after this, you'll write better introductions than your supervisors because you've been thinking about this in a framework that maybe your supervisors, for those of you that are students here, don't actually have now. So it's a constant level, it's a constant process of evolving your skills. And the more that you read and the more that you analyze how 
good papers are put together, the more you will improve your own skills. Okay, so I would, I'd also encourage you to think about this model every time you read a paper. And then you might identify in your own subject areas, papers that you think are really good examples. And then that's an example that you can use to model yourself in the future. So you're not gonna overnight become an amazing introduction writer, but if you've got some frameworks in place, your skills will evolve that much easier. Practice. Thank you. Yes, it's a very interesting uh, lecture. Very good. And so we have many discussion. Uh, firstly, I would like to ask you how to overcome the limitation of the equipment in the laboratory because we have uh, limit uh, equipment and the impact is a long line for written to analog. Yep. This is uh, very different with uh, to the New Zealand or Messi <laughs> when I was at Palmy 20 years ago. <laughs> They have a lot of uh, equipment and uh, it's very fast for uh, analysis. Mm -hmm. This is the first uh, question. The second is um, how you can uh, explain us to uh, a bit uh, clear about robust uh, parameter designs. Yep. Uh, what is that, that the strength and, and the weakness of this design? Yep. And uh, thirdly, I would like to pick up a uh, pick of your permission to use your PowerPoint to uh, lecture or maybe for us uh, how to guide the des design. Yep. Yeah, thank okay. You. Okay, Booty. Um, last question. Absolutely, I said that to start with. You know, yeah. Rennie's got the uh, slides, so please feel free to um, use them as you like. First question. I think you. You know, uh, that's a that's a problem that we all have around the world. I mean, you you say that Massey had great equipment ten years ago. I don't actually think our equipment's changed in the last ten years. So. To be honest, we're struggling with the same sorts of issues with our equipment status. I was hearing today that the end of this year, um, Universitas Brawaja is buying an ICP MS. So I don't have one of those. So you've got an ICP MS, I'll send you my samples and you can analyze my samples. So I think we often use equipment as an excuse. It's just a fact, you know, we are constrained by the equipment we can access. And if we don't have the equipment that we want to do the design or to achieve the design, well, we have to solve that problem. We either change our design or we go and find the equipment. You have plenty of equipment here in Indonesia. Um, I will admit that there are some universities that are even, well, there are some universities that are much worse off. UNRAM have got terrible equipment. I would not trust anything that comes out of UNRAM, but I think you guys have got great equipment. It's just in different places. So you've got to build your collaborations, look at other institutions in Indonesia. Unfortunately, there is a cost involved. That's an internal question about budgets and prioritization of resources. But we all do that. So that is not unique to you. That is a global problem about, you know, how we can actually do our research. So build partnerships, collaboration. Maybe Massey can help you with some things. But I think you'll find other institutions in Indonesia that will also help you. And then you've got some equipment yourself. 
talk to Park Cyril, he'll have to buy some more equipment. The second one, Booty, I mean, that's a really, I mean, that's a whole nother lecture. I mean, how do we make sure that our design is robust? Well, that is actually, again, I think the easiest way is to substantiate our design. All right, so you're going to go off and analyze something or you're going to conduct an experiment. Maybe it's on carbon, just to pick something out. And you're going to look at carbon stocks and soil. So the most robust design that you can apply in that scenario would be to make sure you've got a comprehensive lit review and that you substantiate your method and your approach based on what has been already published. So one of the easiest ways to make sure that you've got a robust design is that you are aware of the knowledge gap, you are aware of what good practice is, and that you cite really credible studies as the framework for your own design. Because if you just make up a design, but you don't justify it, that is not robust. But if you come up with a design and you say, you know, you've profiled the work of someone in science or nature, that's actually going to count you a long way to actually show a reviewer that you've got a robust design. So use your literature, use your citations, use your, re re use your references, because that's actually what's going to save you at the end. Now, there are details that can be added on top of that. Statistics, talking to a statistician. Don't talk to me about design in that sense. Talk to a statistician. There's things like power analysis now, which I don't know anything about. I get my postdocs to do that. But that's important. Making sure that you're using the right statistical analysis packages, okay? Using the right graphics packages. All of these things will enhance the robustness you as the scientist, you've got to work out what is the thing you're trying to interrogate and then use the scientific support to actually build as much robustness as possible. Don't doubt yourself. Talk to people and uh, your science will be. I think one of, the, one of the slides I'm going to say tomorrow on my other half of the presentation is that your science here is as good as the science at Oxford or MIT or Massey or RMIT. It's the scientific process. Just be a good scientist. Resources, you can publish really good papers based on really simple data. So don't look at that as the limitation. Your limitation is actually being a good scientist and then having a structure that communicates that effectively. Thank you. Our time is up. Maybe, uh, okay. One more question, please, from Builia. Thank you, Prof. Chris. It's good lecture for students and also for me as the teacher. <laughs> uh, as you explained before, a good introduction uh, initiated with uh, general cases out as topic, then uh specific to the aim then how about the conclusion that you mentioned this it's really at global not a specific to yep. answer the the aim is yep. uh, first question that uh the second is how about the methodologies for the research how is the good methodology or is not good uh, for the scientific writing Thank you for yep. the question. Okay, no, um, good question. So writing a good conclusion, um, my advice with a conclusion is that, it, well, it's gotta be concise. So if it's a conclusion conclusion, it's gotta be concise. Remember, there's nothing new, there's no new information, there is no new references or citations. So you're only pulling out things that you've already said. So if it's a conclusion, Start with bullet points. Say to yourself, what are my key take-home messages? Maybe there's only one, but you've only got one paragraph conclusion. So you've really got to ask yourself, okay, so what do I want? What is the critical points that I want to communicate? 
and you think about you know what's the one statement i can make that talks about the overall intent of the paper what's the one statement i can make that talks about my results what's the one statement i can make that talks about my discussion and then what's the one statement i can make that answers the so what that's how you write the conclusion it has got to be short sweet and it's got to be able to really leave the reader with that take-home message so the secret with conclusions is not to try too hard and i do suggest just write bullet points and then turn the bullet points into potentially paragraphs that is different if you're not writing a conclusion but you're writing an integrative discussion paragraph and that's a bit different because if you're not writing a conclusion because the journal says you're not allowed a conclusion but you're trying to essentially create a conclusion within your final discussion then you've really got to be thinking the so what so what does this mean and if you've got to you've got to think that in your mind as you write that final bit of integrative discussion but again keep it focused if you're bringing in new information that you want to discuss put it back into the discussion so it's discussed so that you can conclude on it all right so bullet points that's my biggest advice for the conclusion put down some bullet points and then turn those into paragraphs for your methodology that's so variable on your journal it depends on what your journal is looking for so the journal will have guidelines on that but then look at other papers model your methods based on what other people have published if you're trying to publish in plant and soil go and look at some really some plant and soil papers that you think are good see how they've written their methodology section follow it copy the same design that other people have done because the methodology is very much transactional you are simply trying to get sufficient information across so that the reader understands what you've done and can repeat your work and so there using the same sorts of sentence structure as has been used in other papers can be really quite helpful there's less about your kind of influence on that you focus on your introduction and then your results of discussion all right so bullet points and looking at examples that have been done in the past and then modify those i'm here <laughs> that's all okay uh, any feedback Bu Yulia? No, no. So in your conclusion, you shouldn't re you don't need to be bringing it. I mean, if you in your conclusion, if you want to emphasize a key piece of data, then put it in your conclusion. If if part of your conclusion is a value, if you want to say to yourself, the most important thing that I've just I've put into my paper is this value, then that's part of your conclusion. So you've really got to be taking that step back and saying to yourself what is my take-home message now if you've put a key piece of data in your conclusion that's already been said you've already said it you've discussed it you've substantiated it you've explored it all your conclusion is doing is just reiterating in conclusion i have found this moving forward this means that all right that's really what it comes down to so you know, i know i think maybe this is a point for everyone as we wrap up i encourage you to go away and go and look at the most recent publication you've read right and now look at it again with this sort of critical lens on it all right look at the most recent publication you've read because it's in your mind and then go right let's look at the structure not worry about the science let's look at the structure what is their introduction how does that map to an inverted pyramid 
look at the language for their methodology. How have they presented their results? Are they qualitative? Are they quantitative? You know, how are they discussing those results? And then what, how have they produced their conclusion? So don't read the paper for the science, go and read the paper for its story because that's how you improve by being objective and looking at how these bits of work are put together because that is gonna help you reflect on your own work and improve your own writing. And that's the hardest thing about writing papers is actually having the confidence to start and then having something to compare your work against. Okay, thank you for the excellent discussion session. We are, uh, our time is up. So for conclusion of today's guest lecture, before we are writing a scientific articles, we begin with the introduction. To write the good introduction, we should uh, determine the broad problem, then determining the gap, and for the end is uh, aiming of our study. That's all from me, and thank you for uh, attending this today, this guest lecture, and see you next time in another guest lecture. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we finally come to the end of this guest lecture. And before I close the guest lecture, uh, I would like to thank you for our speaker for such as a very informative and interesting presentation. And also thank you for the moderator and all the participants. And before we jump to the Last part, we will have a taking photo session. Please, for all the participants, you can stand up and you can walk and stay here in the front and we will take a photo together. Uh, for a student, please fill ten attendance list in Google form. Mas Anto. Please uh, show the Google form link. Yeah, to get the certificate of uh, today's guest lecture. Please fill this form and you will get the certificate by your email. Thank you. Please, please all participants, please move in here. Okay, thank you all of the part and don't forget to fill the Google form to get a certificate by your email letter. And for the last, please, uh, I'll, I'm as master of ceremony 
of today's guest lecture. I would like to say thank you and I'm closing this guest lecture. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> We have a uh, one more photo session. This is the gift from our faculty for the Professor Christopher Anderson. Okay. Please giving applause. <laughs> Okay. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> and thank you uh, for everyone. And right now I would like to uh, close this guest lecture and wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay.